Our final M-Cube difference presentation for today is Jeweled Net of the Vast Invisible, which includes faculty from the LSA Department of Physics, the Stamp School of Art and Design, and the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, as well as students from the College of Engineering and the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. Joining forces are professors Gregory Tarlet, Jim Cogswell, and Stephen Rush. You are looking at a visualization of the dark matter of our universe. The bright regions represent a network of dark matter halos and filaments separated by voids. Grown from minute quantum fluctuations in our rapidly inflating newborn universe, these structures were then amplified by gravity over billions of years. This invisible net then captured the atoms that formed the stars and galaxies, the jewels that now beckon us in the darkness. Who among us is not moved by the vast expanse of stars that decorate the sky on a clear night? As a scientist, I see more to the universe than meets the eye. There's an invisible world that lies between the stars, a world whose beauty is revealed in numbers and equations. Often I've wondered if it were possible to guide others to this hidden world, to let them feel the overwhelming awe that I feel. I started this cube in the hopes that through art, others could see the unseen that I see and revel in the unfolding story of everything. Let us take a tour through this vast invisible net as we let the dark matter speak to us through sound and light. billion years ago, the beginning of time as we know it. As birthday parties go, this was the biggest blowout of all times. A minute bubble of space and time launched itself into an expansion that continues to this day. Things were very different back then. Space and time curled up so tightly that our common notions of past and future, left and right, up and down, forward and backward, failed to have meaning. But this was rapidly changing. Minute quantum ripples in the geometry of space were already sowing the seeds for the structures that we see in the universe today, while the superluminal expansion of space itself was quickly erasing any evidence of curvature. As the universe expanded, it cooled, and uh, the protons and neutrons that make up our world emerged from a primordial soup of quarks floating in a blinding, opaque bath of light. Just minutes old, the temperature had dropped to a balmy billion degrees, and light nuclei like helium and lithium were born. In 10,000 years, dark matter particles were released from the radiation and began to collapse into the halos and filaments that you've just experienced. By 380,000 years, the temperature had dropped to 3,000 degrees, and atoms could form for the first time, emitting a burst of ultraviolet light. With the electrons safely tucked away inside atoms, this light could finally stream through the newly transparent universe, while the newborn atoms could begin their fall into the dark matter halos. The continued expansion of the underlying space eventually stretched this light into the microwaves and can be seen today as an almost uniform background glow from all directions. Tiny ripples in this glow now reveal the minute variations in temperature and density, faint echoes uh, faint echoes of variations in temperature and density, uh, ripples in space-time carried by ancient sound uh, to the horizon when atoms formed and it could go no further. It was these ripples, amplified noise, which uh, then grew into the galaxy clusters and the galaxies that you see before you in images from the ongoing dark energy survey. These galaxies created a home for the stars and planets and set the stage for life to emerge. We are truly children of the stars. 
The heavy elements that make up our bodies, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, were forged in nuclear reactions in these stars. As they ended their lives, they recycled these, these elements into the interstellar medium to form clouds of gas and dust from which solar systems like ours collapsed. Our Earth, our bodies, are literally made of stardust. This story has not ended. The universe continues to expand under, and, and accelerate uh, under the influence of a mysterious dark energy that makes up 75% of the universe. The story of our origins and of our destiny, the story of everything, is written in the unseen. To see the unseen, we started with data from the Millennium Simulation, which used supercomputers to evolve 10 billion particles, uh, to evolve 10 billion dark matter particles to the present epoch. Our challenge was, produ was to produce a visualization of this dark world that allows others to experience the beauty of the dark side of the universe. As living creatures, we see only what we pay attention to through the lens of what we already know and assume to be real. The job of an artist is to call our attention to the overlooked, the undervalued, and the unconsidered, sometimes using the unreal to draw our attention to what is really out there. The object of attention might be as breathtaking as cosmology or as ordinary as rain, or it might be the very act of perception itself. The problems we face in our m project are inherent in all cosmological visions. The problem of making the awe-inspiring accessible to human perception without trivializing it, giving it a dimension that we can, if not understand, at least experience without reducing it to our scale. This problem has been encountered in modern philosophy, art, and literature since the dawn of the scientific revolution and is familiar to us in the humanities as the problem of the sublime. In our visualization process, which was carried out with the ABLE collaboration of computer science student Jason Eaton, here are some of the problems we've been addressing. First, data size. Visualizing massive data sets disrupts our sensory expectations and brings us to the limits of our physical intuitions. Our original ambition was to explore this one billion strong data set in real time. But that pushes the limits of modern graphics algorithms as well as our logical conceptualization of the universe. Second, translation. Before technological innovations of the last few decades, information about the fundamental nature of the universe was made accessible primarily by metaphor, visual analogy, and narrative. Using technology, clusters of dark matter have become clusters of information in our computers. Visualizing them transforms the data into something we can experience. However, in order to create a representation that we can perceive, we have to be selective, finding a balance between particles that are near and far, small and large, those we allow to remain dark, and those to which we assign a given luminosity. The character of the luminosity itself is determined by multiple factors such as density and velocity dispersion within the halos. We have the power to use variations in color and intensity to represent this information. But in doing so, we shape what aspect of that information is available to our senses. Third, structural boundaries. The cosmos is thought to be infinite in size, and gravity can be felt by every piece of matter within it. If we were to light up all halos representing the forces of dark matter at once, we would encounter a fully illuminated sky, known in physics as Olber's paradox. By being carefully selective in our graphics algorithms, we can deal with the quandary that seeing all the information at once will obscure its structure. We address this problem by focusing on a band of space at a given distance from our camera position having particles fade in from the back as they enter that band moving forward, and having them fade out as they approach within a given distance of our viewpoint. The fascinating web-like structure becomes visible only by being selective as to what we see. This M-cubed funding has introduced me, as a visual artist, to a wondrous universe of the unseen and the unseeable. 
And it's infected me with the awe and wonder that Greg feels. This is not a place I could reach on my own. It only happened through the M-cubed experience. And it will have manifold, unforeseeable consequences in my creative work and teaching in the future. I love working with this team. Well, this is the difference between um, a musician and a visual artist and an astrophysicist. They use a teleprompter. I use a piece of paper that's been through the wash about three times. <laughs> but, um, Thank you, M-Cube, for allowing me to work with these two amazing people. Um, it, I've been hoping to work with Jim for years and years, and Greg is an in incredible colleague, and it's just really been fantastic. From this study, I've learned two meta-human truths. One of those meta-human truths is that we are moving further away all the time. The universe is expanding, and I'm not sure if I feel good or bad about that. But, you know, it's like, well, it's kind of a good thing that we're getting bigger, but then we're moving away from each other, and it makes me feel lonely, so I'm not sure. Um, and then there's this other meta-human truth, is that we are all the same thing. As Greg said earlier, we are star people. We come from this same primordial boom, this sound. We often popularly call it the Big Bang. In India, they call it nada, not to be confused with the Spanish word nada. But it's this nada thing that happens at the beginning. And it creates all these jewels in the universe. And those jewels reflect each other on a microcosmic level so that you look inside each of these nodes, you see us at the deepest level possible. So we're all the same. We're all connected. Or as my mom told me the day before she died, she said, Steve, everybody is everybody. A very poetic way to talk about post-quantum physics, I think. So I've written two pieces. I do what composers do. I make noise. So I wrote two pieces. One you heard earlier accompanying our montage with Electric Carillon, and it's a piece called Dark Matters. It's kind of a pun. And that piece uses granular synthesis, a way to take little chunks of sound, little digital chunks of sound, and explode those out in different ways, manipulate the sound, or filtering, if you will. So that's one piece, and that's going to be recorded next next. I don't know, summer, I guess. And there's another piece I'm writing for this thing, which is for jazz trio, of all things. And I'm using Kepler's mistaken notion that you could map scales into the ellipses around the sun by the planets. So it's like Mercury is major and Venus is minor. Astronomers and musicians were mixed back then, Greg. So it was kind of a problem. Galileo's dad was a great composer as well. So, but it is inspiring information and a place for me to start. And that, those two pieces will combine as a backdrop or something, accompaniment, I don't know, to a large presentation we're going to do in April. Imagine a drive-in movie with this stuff on it, with electronic sort of music playing from enormous speakers and food late at night, <laughs> yeah under the stars. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to do a gig. We're going to invite you to it in late April. We hope you all can make it on the North Campus Diag. Thank you, MQ, for letting this happen.